back then it never occurred to me that writing was a viable anything. I mean, it was just something people did to kind of waste time. Like nobody actually wrote, published anything. <laughs> Hello, thank you for tuning in. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Victoria Gherkin, the head of acquisitions at Podium Audio. We are an audio first entertainment studio and indie audiobook publisher that finances, develops, produces, and distributes immersive audio content. But enough about Podium. Let's get to the real reason why we're here today, and that is introduce you to our two guests. While she is while she has a degree in aerospace engineering, she now spends her time imagining flying dragons rather than spaceships. She is the author of the epic fantasy series, The Keeper Chronicles, J.A. Andrews, who we I... will be calling Janice today. This yes. Very good to be here. And with 300, over 300 titles under your belt, uh, he is now a household name in the audiobook industry. He was nominated for Best Performance by a Male Narrator in 2019 at the Audio Awards and has previously been a five-time Audio nominee. He is the recipient of multiple Audiophile Earphones Awards and has twice been listed in Audiophile Magazine's Best of the Year, the one and only Tim Gerard Reynolds. Hi, Tim. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for putting down whatever book you're reading and joining us live. <laughs> So Janice, uh, my first question is to you. Um, so we understand the Keeper Chronicles began as, as emails to your husband to keep him entertained while he was away. So tell us a bit more about um, that epistolary uh, storytelling. Uh, yes, Chronicles. My, husband, uh, my husband was in medical school um, long ago. I was trying to think of what year it was and I can't tell you that like 12 or 13 years ago, I think. Anyway, it was long enough ago that we had uh, email, but if we had cell phones, we did not text on them. So okay. there was- so, no oh, five, phone. maybe, a oh, five-ish, yeah. no <laughs> iPhone. Reasonable. And so um, he was in Pennsylvania for a month rotation and uh, he was really bored. I mean, there no Netflix, no nothing, right? So uh, I would send him a chapter, I'd write a chapter during the day and send it to him so that when he got home, he would have something to read. Um, and my only goal was to make it, like try and keep him entertained and then leave him on a huge cliffhanger because then that was funny because then he emailed me back like, what? And so I usually didn't know where the cliffhanger was leading. I just tried to end it, this was something crazy happening. Um, and so I, what turned into probably the first 10 chapters of a Thread of Shadows, which is the first book, uh, came from those emails. And he came back into town and I had no more reason to write this thing. So the story just got put away. Um, but I, the characters in it just stayed, they just stayed in my head. And back then it never occurred to me that writing was a viable anything. I mean, it was just something people did to kind of waste time. Like nobody actually wrote and published anything. <laughs> so I, but it, and it was probably 2012 or 2013 when I started to realize that indie publishing was actually a thing and people were uh, publishing books and finding readers and and so the story that had just stayed in my mind for all these years you know I thought you know I'm gonna pull that back out and I'm gonna look at it and see and so uh, it took a lot of cleaning up but and a lot of learning how to write a story I didn't know anything about anything and so um, but yeah that, that was the beginning of it and so it just kind of grew into one book and I was pretty sure I wanted it to be a series, but I had no idea where the series was going to go. Figured I'd put one book out there and see what it did, but people enjoyed it. So I went on to write books two and three. So did you continue reading aloud to him? I, I was the sort of the, the performative like aspect of the story. I mean, was that in your mind? Like knowing that this was going to be, you know, a story that you were telling your husband, I mean, you were writing it, but you were really telling it to him. Yeah, I, I didn't tell him as I went. Um, I was so like immersed in trying to learn how to do good storytelling and what goes into a good plot. All these things that you never think about to try and write a story and realize you don't know any of it. Um, but I did very much keep in mind that it was for him because uh, anytime 
I got sort of off tone or things started to fizzle out, I would realize that I'd forgotten that I was writing something to entertain a specific person and the things that I knew would make him laugh or that he would be interested in were, were a good way to keep the book really focused, I think. So I don't think I got to read it until right before I published. Um, but I had made him um, discuss plot issues with me on and off for a couple years. So he, I think he knew what was going to happen. But Right. Amazing. Um, so Tim, this is actually, we're, we're publishing the, um, the trilogy all in one package. Um, it's 42 hours. Uh, I know you have done some real monster books mm -hmm. um, for us <laughs> and also for others. And you're no stranger to epic fantasy, which tends to be, you know, on the long side. Uh, how did you prepare uh, for this particular book? I sat under the cherry tree in my back garden in the afternoons of spring, and I just immersed myself in the book. It was very easy to do because it's such an evocative book. Um, it's one of the f those few books that um, when you're preparing for it, you know, I set out X amount of pages per day per book. And I would get to that X and I'd go, no, I'm going to keep reading. It was just that good. And um, the, the, when I prepare a book in general, uh, uh, characters just sort of uh, either speak to me or they don't. And, and when they do speak to me, I can almost imagine their faces. And I find that when I can see their faces, their voice comes as well. And also I get really taken up with um, atmosphere. So I tend to kind of look for those things deliberately. And I'm always um, delighted when I don't have to look for them, when those things um, uh, just pop up and unbidden, mm -hmm. as it were, surprising. I, I, and I, I don't like, Jay, you're going to find this very strange. I don't like to, to look up an author, especially if it's an, a new author, because I don't want to start. I'm a, I'm a kind of a people pleaser by, by nature. And I immediately think, oh, I better do this, you know, this way or that way, whatever. So it's only after the fact that I um, yeah, researched you and found out that you were um, J.A. Andrews was Janice. And I thought to myself, of course, um, what an incredible, you know, incredible female characters. But to, to prep, like I said, um, it, it, it's just a matter of um, uh, basically just taking the characters into myself and allowing my subconscious to do the work. Um, of course, reading the the book through um, beforehand uh, is especially helpful because you need to know what happens basically um, uh, to try to, to kind of evoke the atmosphere. And um, by and large, um, the other thing too is actually just trying to kind of nail down how you're going to pronounce things, especially in the fantasy world, and, and get that kind of consistent so that it'll, it'll stay the same throughout the, the books. And um, you know, once I've got those things done, it um, I, I'm usually like about two books ahead in my prep. So by the time I come around to the book, I've already read about maybe two other books. So it's always a welcome return to the world of the book. And it's almost like rediscovering it anew when I when I get to read it out loud. But already the characters are there. They've been percolating in my mind. Not that I, not that I have to do much to create characters because unlike um, drama, the, you've done most of the work for me. So um, all I have to do is try to kind of stick with those images that were evoked. Um, I'm, I'm sure that if somebody else was to read the book, they'd have a different take again. So it is kind of subjective, but at the same time, I try to do my best to be as, uh, as close as I can to the spirit of the book um, by just, it, it, it's very instinctual. It's just an imaginative mm -hmm. like, exercise at the end of the day. So did you, I, I'm not sure what happened with the prep from your end, Janice, did you, did you provide some of the um, pronunciations for Tim? Any particular uh, sort of character notes? I think I did, there was a, a quick list of characters and maybe how they related to each other mm -hmm. and the pronunciation. I don't, um, I'm not one of the fantasy authors that has this elaborate kind of language created and strange names with apostrophes and dashes like it people's names are will and i mean they were a little bit off but nothing like crazy i don't think um so is i did there, a small pronunciation guide but i don't think it was anything earth-shaking is there a particular character that you are really i, I have to, have you listened to any of the book yet have you heard I any have of not. I haven't heard a single word of it is there is there any particular character that you're really excited about how how tim 
brought them to life? Probably Will, who's the main character in the second book. Each book has its own main character. Um, m- mostly because Will was just really fun to write. He, he was a very fun character in my mind. So I'm interested to see him struggle his way through that book. <laughs> Hear what it's like. <laughs> um, well, I was going to leap to something else, but maybe this is the moment. Tim, do you want to read us a little bit of the book? Sure, I'd love no, to. Speaking ahead. of, I, I was just saying to Victoria beforehand um, in an email, but this was, all I had to do is just put my finger somewhere and it's going to be an interesting spot to read. So, um, but Will also was a favorite character of mine, <clears throat> especially for those reasons he's witty. Actually, all the characters are so beautifully dif- differentiated. That's what, I, that's what I found so wonderful about this. So I'm going to read a bit of Will, just a few minutes of Will. Oh, I better I need my glasses, doesn't <laughs> Getting old. <laughs> Will shoved himself off the bed. Who are you? He shot back. She ignored the question. You shouldn't be here. A roving accent bit the words off harshly. Will stared at her for a moment. This is my room. Trying to gauge her emotions, he opened up toward her. The same emptiness blossomed in his chest. He focused more. Searching until he felt an undercurrent of anger, deep and old, foundational. The sort of emotion that had been there her entire life. Anger surrounded by coldness and emptiness. He could see her face, but her dark ranger leathers blurred into the shadows, making her somehow part of the darkness, except a glint of silver from a knife hilt at her belt. She stepped forward, and he forced himself to hold his ground. I'm usually better at reading people. The shock of her presence quickly wore off, and was replaced with anger at her audacity. I had the impression you didn't like me, not that you were headed into my room for a midnight visit. He still felt nothing. This woman exuded less emotion than anyone he'd ever met. His own body, on the other hand, thrummed with wariness and alarm. The door stood between them, and Will had the urge to run. But outside this room, he would have still been just as trapped. A foreigner running down the streets, chased by a roven. That story did not end well. Who are you? she repeated. Will gestured to his bright red shirt. I thought the shirt made it obvious, and the story I told tonight. She said nothing. I'm a storyteller. From Gulfind, he almost added, but the lie felt too blatant. Her eyes glittered out of the dimness, giving Will the wild impression that she could see through shadows, and somehow into him. You sound like you're from Queensland. Will's chest tightened, but he kept his voice light. The people from Queensland and Gulfind sound remarkably alike, which was one of the main reasons he'd picked Gulfind as his pretend home. The countries are on such good terms that the family trees along the border are muddled with folk from both countries. She, he waited for her to do or say, I'm sorry, he waited for her to do or say anything. There's a whole history behind that, but since I make my living as a storyteller, you'll have to pay me if you want to hear it. Leave the sweep. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yay! That was fantastic. Sorry, I messed up at the end. I, I punched like, ah! <laughs> That's what I do all the time. <laughs> By myself, mess up. Oh, in this case, <laughs> no punching. No punching and correcting. <laughs> That was excellent. Sora was a woman in there is my, probably my other very favorite character. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, the great characters. In fact, all through this, the, the entire trilogy, that's what I said, it's, um, it's rare, you know, I was really struck by the psychological depth of the characters. That's, that's what really got me, actually. They're all very different. They all have their different motives, whether they're, um, you know, epic, you know, like Lucas, or just like, you know, not, you know, what mundane almost, uh, like the 
um, melee, for example. <laughs> um, but but um, um, you really get that, I think, you know, and I, and I, that's what I, I, I'm really attracted to that kind of thing because because it makes it very interesting for me, especially because I like to be able to change the, in between different uh, um, character voices and stuff. Well, I was looking at the um, the Amazon rankings, and, and at this moment in time, the audiobook hasn't come out when we're taping this, but um, it will come out. It will have come out by the time you guys see it out there. Um, but the Amazon ratings on the the book are incredible. I mean, rarely do you see fourteen hundred reviews on anything, and actually, the, they ticked up overnight from like thirteen ninety nine to fourteen hundred. So, congrats on that, Janice. I mean, that is an amazing. That is that tells you, you know, supports what we're saying, what Tim's saying about how great this book is. Um, but the other thing I noticed is that the fans seem to be really diverse, like different age groups have have come to this. I mean, do you do you have a sense of of why that is? I mean, I'm getting a sense from what Tim's saying about the characters and the depth of the characters. Um, but do you have a do you kind of have a sense for how you've managed to create that? Um, I wish I had a really good sense because then I feel like I could repeat it easily. <laughs> Sometimes when they're unknown, I think, will I ever do it again? I don't know. Um, my books are very they're very clean, like PG rating, probably. And I don't know what that is in the UK, but um, I write them so that my um, my oldest is 14 and he loves reading. And so I wanted just immediately for him to be able to uh, pick up anything I wrote and read it. So uh, that limited some of the more objectionable, <laughs> grittier topics that go into a lot of books. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, so so a lot of people will, will call them YA books, I think just because there's cl they're clean. Um, not because my characters are young, because um, my characters are in their 30s or 40s or occasionally in their 20s. Um, but yeah, I'm not totally sure. I, um, I have trouble um, connecting with like an epic quest in a story if I don't have a really personal reason for the character to be on that quest and so I do feel like a lot of times I'm I'm focused really tightly on a single character and and why what it matters to them like like they usually are all for saving the world but unless they have like a really personal reason as to why they are involved that's really keeping them motivated I find that I lose interest and so I think um, maybe just the fact that it's so narrowed down I don't know. A lot of the reviews oh, yeah. talk about the characters for that reason. Yeah, so. yeah, and it's it's you know, character-driven storytelling appeals broadly to you know fourteen-year-olds and to I think there's somebody in the reviews that said they were like I'm seventy and I love this. And there's so also everything. The fact that, um, I, I found that you really do touch on some like dark things. But in such a way that, you know, you, there's no, like, it's not replete with gore, there's no, like, mass, you know, nothing like that, or foul language or anything. But you're able to deal with dark things, and it's not like just dark, evil things, it's just literally dark things in the human psyche. And I think that, you know, kids on some level would, would kind of identify that. They have their own problems to deal with. They've got people in the schoolyard that don't like them, and this, that, and the other. That can, that can, they can identify with that just as much as somebody who has been through 50 years of their life, or whatever, like myself. Um, uh, so, so um, I thought that the absence of those kind of that kind of graphic violence, coupled with that kind of psychological depth that you got, gives rise to um, a more profound experience because your imagination is able to engage with it more. I think. Well, great. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I know like, the first book, um, Alaric, who's the main character in the first book his wife is dying and he's yeah. tried to see her and he's he's done all these he's always thought of himself as a, a good person but in his desperation to try and save her he's gone to a lot of dark places and so really the whole book he's kind of struggling with this concept of you know did I am I defined by these worst things that I've done or is that just a part of me and I can move past it and I can choose to be different and stuff like that. And so I feel kind of shocked that younger people 
like that story too because it's it's a man and his wife. I mean, it's not. It's sort of a big love story because he's trying to save her the whole time, but it's not like a romance story necessarily. And it's a very, if, to me, it feels like a very adult concept of how the things that I've done wrong. How how much do they define me, or can I move past it? Um, but it's, it's interesting that you bring it up because for sure children are the same way. You know, if I've if I was terribly naughty, even just yesterday, if I was horrible to my sister yesterday, does that mean I'm a horrible brother? Or can I choose today to like be better? And so, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way before, but I, I feel like that's something I've been surprised that people have not minded that my characters are older, but the younger readers haven't minded that at all. Well, I no, think gen- sort of a Sorry. discovery yeah. of, you know, when you become conscious of your own mortality as it is kind of in your teen years when you start thinking, yeah, I'm could die. I will die. <laughs> and I think that's, I mean, yeah, that's a dark place to go. But when you see it in literature and you can kind of see it coped with by other people, I think, I think that's, you know, not to call it entertainment, but that it's important. And I think kids will connect with that. I think also, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an epic deceit at the heart of the middle part of the, the book that I think will take takes readers by surprise. And I think everybody can identify with with betrayal, I think, with a friend doing something behind your back or whatever like that. And and um, I didn't see it coming. And uh, it, it was really, it was really, you know, now that kind of ruined it, but for people no. who know, but, um, but no, but I found that, that that's, that's definitely something that, that, that I think any, anybody can identify with. And, and I found, found the theme of, of good people doing bad things for good reasons happens to many characters in this book and they often either have to deal with it right away or they in, end up having to deal with it at some point later down the line um, and uh, I love that stuff yeah we were talking a little bit um, before we came on about the the location of the, the story in the first book is it the first book or the second book second book all right so the the grasslands of Montana you were talking about, Tim, is that? Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, I, I, sorry, Jones, go ahead. I I didn't say anything. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, was... um, no, that's right. I I I've I've been lucky enough to be in Montana a couple of times and uh, hiked in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and to get to it, I've got to go sometimes go to Great Falls from Missoula, and there's a road that goes south of the park. And it's in this incredible expanse of large grass that, you know, those prairie, giant grass prairies that um, I've only ever seen in movies. And so the first time I saw it, it was absolutely stunning because they, they reflect the sunlight and, they, and the sky and what have you. But it goes on right to the horizon, you know, it's just like, like hills. And when I picked, started reading this book, I went, this is just like Montana. And... <laughs> It was Montana. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the first book takes place with like forests and mountains and valleys. And at that time, we were actually living in the mountains in Montana, and there were forests and mountains and valleys. And at the beginning of writing book two, we actually moved actually to Great Falls, Montana, which is definitely on the prairie. Um, and as soon as you just get outside of town at all, like past the last house, it's just yes, these grasslands that just go and go and go, and they're sort of stunning, but they're also they're this weird combination of full of life and also totally lifeless. Like there'll be a single color, this like kind of brown or light green, and you'll see the way like waves almost from the wind going across them. They're they're kind of they're stunning, but they feel very isolating. And so when I started writing book two, Will, who's from the other land with the mountains and the trees and everything, he comes to this grassland and. Um, it was very easy for me to, as I had just been in the mountains and we'd moved to the grasslands, which I was not excited about. It was very easy for me to come up with Will's voice of just being like, oh, like just grass. Everywhere I look, it's just grass. There's nowhere, you know, he's feeling vulnerable. So there's just nowhere to hide. You know, there's, it's all just exposed and open. And so, yeah, it was, it was so, so easy to write that setting. <laughs> <laughs> It's very evocative. It, it really does take your take your mind take you away, your imagination away right off the bat. Yeah. Now I'm imagining um, we hear from a lot of um, uh, long haul drivers 
uh, who listen to audiobooks. And uh, I'm imagining one of them now popping in. I was about to say the tape. There's not going to be a tape. It's going to be <laughs> Uh, with the Keeper Chronicles and driving through some of that grassland and connecting with that through the audiobook. There's a lot of our country that they'll be yes. <laughs> that qualifies as that. Yeah. Nebraska. Yes. Yeah, maybe yes, less I grassland. <laughs> I kind of wish we'd talk more about female characters because they're so strong in this book, these books as well. You know, you have really... I, uh, it, what I meant to say at the beginning, when I d didn't research you, was uh, I thought to myself, this has to be written by a woman, because the characters are so so well well defined, and well written, and, and deep, you know. And that's uh, um, uh, I got that one. I've, I won that bet with myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you did say that. I think you did say that a little bit. At least, yeah. you, and then you, but then you don't get to offend all the male yeah. writers who will then say, "Oh, Tim, I wrote good." But honestly, honestly, Janice, I know you've probably, you, maybe you haven't, I know you've probably read a lot of fantasy, but but it's rare to find female characters like, like you've written. Uh, it really is. I mean, a lot of times it's like, it's they're almost like some adolescent, like I said, like an adolescent boy's version of a woman. And yet these were very fully rounded out, deep uh, characters that, that have a, a story arc to them, that mature and develop. And it was such a pleasure. I mean, all of the characters, I mean, you have to say, it's always, always a rare treat to be able to get a bunch of characters like that that are all so well-defined and, and just, and, oh, here we are, we're at will again. Great. And then, you know, <laughs> Lucas, oh. <laughs> Although I got to like Lucas in the end, really. Poor bastard. <laughs> it's a misled guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the female characters, I, it took me until the third book to have a main character who was female. Um, I know. And I think, so I grew up reading 80s and 90s classic fantasy. And so, I mean, I just read male characters. Like my whole childhood was male characters. Um, yeah, and the females were, I mean, they were there, but they weren't usually, I don't know, very fleshed out. Um, it felt very natural to have male main characters. Um, but the more I wrote, the more the female, Ada is a female elf and she became favorite character very quickly as I was writing. So it was just, it was, it was fun. Yeah, it was just fun to give these female characters voices, their own voices and their own, their own goals and motivations that, that weren't the same as the main character. Like sometimes they lined up and sometimes they were opposing each other, but it was really nice to have them. So yeah, and no, you, I could definitely, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was gonna, and and the two of you have in common, I think, um, love of the outdoors and hiking. Um, Janice, were you imagining some of your your longer hikes, uh, sending your characters out on on quests? Uh, yes, and I, I often get reviews about people that they say like their least favorite parts of the story are when uh, the characters are in the cities or when they're. Uh, they're stuck at the palace with the queen and stuff. And so there's this sort of internal city world going on. And everyone's like, it wasn't as fun in that part. I was like, huh, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah, like it, I, I feel like I'm always pushing them out of doors and sending them through forests and stuff. Just, I mean, if, if, I, if I get to create a world, then yeah, it's fun to put all the different outdoor parts into it. I felt it was very close to nature. I think that's, that's really kind of... Um... Amazing is that you can have a couple of characters in the Queen's Court, like you said, being diplomatic and trying to find, you know, work with different political factions or whatever. And then suddenly they're sent on a mission and within an hour or two, they're on a bedroll out under a tree somewhere in the, in the wilderness. You know, and, and I think that, yeah, you did definitely, in all of the books, you, you've, you managed to conjure up these wonderful landscapes like the Scale Mountains. Um, you were very evocative and, and the beautiful um the valley of the keepers as well um i've seen valleys like that in the like hidden valleys in the sierras you know you go in you've, you've hiked like three days to get there and you know that you're the only person there at all and it's just beautiful you wonder how is it nobody sees these things but and you were able to conjure that that up especially with the keepers and so when there was the threat to the valley i was like no don't please no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because they're always in threat, these places. Well, Tim, you've been to Iceland. Yeah. The land of 
a very, very evocative sort of land of ice and fire. Yes. Have you been there, yes. Janet? Have you been to Iceland? No, but I would love to. It's, it's well worth it. Just drive north, go in, go to the north. Incredible landscape. Absolutely. It's, it's like the west of the United States meets the west of Ireland, and it just, it's, it's crazy. Really crazy. So go for your the, to be inspired for the next setting, for your next series. There you go. I will. <laughs> you can expense it. It's a business Great. expense because you're a, you're a writer making your money from this business. Exactly. That's right. right. You can write it Take your tax advice from me, please. I'm just the audio <laughs> publisher. <laughs> it was so it was really fun getting to watch you read a little bit of that because I was talking to my kids and my husband beforehand about what kind of questions to ask you. And I thought, how still are you? Like I when I write, I've actually started dictating a little bit to to write. And I find that I like gesture like crazy and I expressions and I probably look a little bit crazy. But I was wondering when you are doing this, how I mean, are you sitting? Do you stand? Do you wave your hands? How like how much motion is involved? <laughs> oh, it's jeez. You know, you, you have to really keep very still, especially in a in a in a mic environment, because your 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 shirt will rustle or your chair will creak or something like that. But and that inevitably is going to happen. And and um, you know, I, I catch I catch those things occasionally. And most of the time, I don't. And I try to tell you, <laughs> I've got to do corrections for that reason. But um, um, I I I so I when I get into it, I don't realize what I'm doing. Um, but I will find myself sometimes doing something like that, or I'll hit the microphone by accident and go, oh, I didn't realize I did that. But, so I'm not, I, I, I assume I'm still, but um, I always, always find myself catching, I always catch myself doing something stupid like jumping in my chair or whatever. <laughs> you get the WD-40 out. Yeah, out. yeah I know. That's, you know, I've tightened this chair so many times. Yeah. <laughs> You know. Do you have do you have certain? Well, I, I, um, I was interested in some of the themes you brought up. I mean, one of the things that uh, is really, really um, uh, comes to the fore in the stories is, is just is human trafficking. Basically, I was wondering if that was something consciously that you chose to um, to sort of make a theme in the story because they're not obviously the. The words human trafficking don't occur in the book, but but there are slaves and you tell a story from a slave's point of view and what have you. And um, and there is the terrible thing that happens. I, you see, I, I'm afraid if I say too much, I'll ruin it for people. So I don't want to let too much away. But I definitely you definitely feel just how bad that is and how even the people who perpetrated it struggle with it as well. I found that interesting, too. We, that was ob, ob, a conscious choice in your part, I guess. Um, It was. I, <laughs> It was a conscious choice to, I, I think, to put the idea in there. Um, I've actually had some like negative reviews that I wasn't, that, that I, I didn't come out, I guess, enough against human trafficking or that I kept, um, there are characters like Killian who has, he has slaves and he's, uh, he thinks he treats them well. And so he's not like terribly apologetic. I mean, he's not, I'm, I didn't leave a revolution to, free all the slaves or anything like that um so i there have been I, a few reviews have sort of criticized that i didn't sort of take it in that direction um but it, it felt more that there's so many ways as humans that we control each other and that we uh, so many dark ways that we interact with each other and these people in the story who were just searching for power really and taking these slaves um for what they could, the powers that these people had, and these different, I, it was something I wanted to touch on without really digging deep into maybe like what we should do about it, but more like see yeah. the different characters' feelings about. Some of them were just flat out appalled by it. Other ones were sort of trying to justify it. There was, yes, yeah, Cindy is, she was kept in slavery for a while, and so her just feelings of once she was freed from that too, what. Who is she, and where does she belong? And you know, it, these. So it was more of a just dynamic of this control that we have over each other sometimes, and the different ways it plays out, and how we all 
deal with it. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it does indeed. And I think that it also touches on, upon something else as well, where you have um, people struggling to find out who they act actually are, what the role is in the world. Um, like you have these keepers that are taken away from the family at an early age. I think for good reason, you know, the family's, with the family's blessing. And then you have the, the other side of it where people were ripped away from their families without consent. And um, you then have the character of Killian who's trying to live up to his dead father's ghost almost and, and live up to some mythical traditions about the tribe and what have you. And really, you know, you know that he knows in his heart of hearts that he just, uh, you know, why, yeah. why do I have to keep, why do I have to be doing that? He's a, he's a smart guy. That's what is really wonderful is you wrote smart people and they come out cross as really smart. That's that's very hard to do. <laughs> Will is a wonderful character. Will is a wonderful character. It really, really is. He was fun to write. His um all the keepers have magic vaguely related to each other. Magic, it all works similarly, but they have different strengths and stuff. And Will's is that he can uh, sense other people's emotions. If he's, if he's close to them, he can sense what they're feeling, which is why with Sora in the selection mm -hmm. that Tim read, uh, she doesn't emote at all. And so he gets a little freaked out because he, he uses this to read people and to be able to be a good storyteller and to, to be able to interact well with people so he can read them really well. Um, but it, it was really fun to write him because I just thought about what if, what if you could walk through life and always know what that person across from you was thinking about what you were saying because so often you know you'll I'll go through a whole conversation and they'll answer and I'll think that what like you and I weren't even thinking the same thing at all and so it was really it was really interesting to be able to have this instant feedback of what somebody was thinking about you or if you said something that you thought was not a big deal and suddenly they're very angry you know it, it's such an insight into the other person if you could read them that clearly and it was just interesting another it was a lot of exploring sort of how connected we are and how when we really understand what the person that we're dealing with is feeling just how much more we understand them how much more we relate to them and um yeah he, he's put in with people that he kind of thinks he would hate that he has a lot of prejudice against but as yeah. he gets to know them better i think he just recognizes so much more of what he has in common with them because he can sense them so well. So I even- think it was Sorry, Janice. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I thought you'd finish, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I found it intriguing that um, one of the first things that Will learns to do when he becomes a keeper as a, as a child is to tune out people's emotions, to be able to kind of like get them out of his life. And so he's able, you know, he finds that there are, there are pro inappropriate times, so he switches off. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is that thing where um, he doesn't he doesn't want to like somebody, and yet he finds himself liking that person despite the bad things they may have done or something. Um, so he's he's really able to kind of detect the sort of gray areas that people kind of live in. That's mm -hmm. what I looked. Yeah, there's so much. There's a lot of gray. I mean, a lot of fantasy can be black and white. You know, good, you know, good evil kind of thing but this is there's always this in between i think a lot of the good characters have you know black marks for want of a better word and some of the bad characters are just trying to do what they think is best <laughs> you know and i think that really kind of i think that really rings true true to people i think when when i i would imagine when they read this it definitely did to me it's something else uh because the books are they don't have a lot of violence there's no sex there's no language um and so a lot of people i think think that it's going to end up a very black and white, that we're going to have the good guys and the bad guys and whatever. Um, but I really feel like, I don't know, as soon as you start actually getting to know people, and if you're trying to write a character who's real, like we're all so gray, and not in a morally gray way, like we're all ready to do something horrible and evil at any given moment. But I think even like people that are really striving to do good, there's so many conflicting things inside of us. You know, there's always like a self, a very selfish motivation too to keep going or to. I, there's just so many shades of gray <laughs> that I don't feel like you have to get gory or violent to show how complicated all of us are. Even when we're really trying to do what we think is right, it's still it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, and then um, there's the the dragon um, 
it was the first dragon I've ever come across in, in the book that uh, really represents sort of that chaotic force of nature. There's no intent behind this dragon, really. It's just <laughs> straight up, I'm going to do what I'm going to do best, which is blow the hell out of them. <laughs> you know, and people trying to harness that power. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I don't. Um, so, I mean, I love I would like how to train your dragon is hilarious and all these things. Um, and so many people write humans pairing with dragons and working together and all these kinds of things but in my mind and i don't know if i just read too much tolkien as a child but in my mind like a dragon is like the apex predator of all of them <laughs> yeah it's intelligent but it has no it's not like i'm really wishing i could bond with these human beings it's just like yeah. if i'm hungry i'm gonna eat you doesn't care. If i'm not hungry i'm not and maybe i'll burn something down like i yeah so um it was, it was fun to write there's not a ton, yeah. like, Dragon doesn't show up a, a million times, it comes in and out of the story, but, yeah, it was fun to write just something that was just, uh, just purely predatory, and so yeah. big, he didn't care, like, really no one in the story was a threat to him, different people try to control him at certain times, but he wasn't in danger, I don't think of, I, I, the poor keepers, like, they, they don't have a good way to fight off a dragon and they keep running into this problem that the dragon comes back and they, they still don't have a way to fight it. I don't think anybody has a way to fight it. It's yeah. just too, too big and powerful. Relentless chaos. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that can be Mother Nature. Yes. There is that no can. way. There's no way to tame that dragon. Yes. And it does feel fun to have something, something too big for everyone in your story to deal with. You know, that they have their own thing going on, but that but there's something that just, it's just too big and too powerful. I feel like in, I mean, at, in life, yeah, there's lots of things too big and too powerful. You're not gonna fix it. You're not gonna change it. You're not gonna conquer it. And so we kind of have to live under that shadow. It felt very nice to have just this big, frightening force that yeah. might show up at any time. Yeah. <laughs> And see if see if the disparate uh, groups of people will band together or not. Exactly. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you guys for being available on this afternoon and taking some time from your schedule, from writing and from reading. Tim, thank you. And um, I just wanted to thank you for watching out there. And just a reminder that the Keeper Chronicles complete trilogy is available in audio from Audible and also in ebook and on paperback uh, on Amazon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Janice. Thank Thanks, Vicky. <laughs>